Hey, welcome our city church. My name is Pastor Chris. If you are new around here, I want to welcome you. It is great to meet you and to all of the our city family both here in california uh, and all around our nation and all around the world i want to welcome you thank you for being here today uh, i want to let you know something really exciting uh, is coming up in the next couple weeks we're going to be telling you all about what god's going to be doing in our church we got some wonderful things to announce and we'll be doing that over the next two weeks and in two weeks we launch our home series and if you're new around here again every year we stop for a few weeks and we just talk about the home okay the home that you grew up in the home that you got right now maybe the home one day you want to build uh, for yourself if you're single you're like man I want to make sure I could build a great home someday uh, we take a few weeks every year and talk about home and so that's gonna happen in two weeks please please set aside time uh, for the weeks of August to make sure that we can build into our homes because I don't know about you uh, actually I do know about you look we need some help in our homes anyways because we've been in them too dang much over the last many many months so uh, I, I want to invite you to that and, and, and challenge you also uh, to be prepared to share invite your friends and send the links over and say hey I, this has been helping me I, I believe it can help you so that's in two weeks and I'm excited about that I want to pause for a second and just say thank Thank you uh, to you as a community, as a church, for being such a loyal, a supportive, an energetic uh, church and uh, for, for being there week in and week out. Uh, we are the church we are because of who you are. And I mean it from, from my family to yours uh, and our staff to you. Thank you so much for being so faithful to God and faithful to our city church and the vision God's placed um, on our church. And I personally, on a personal note, thank you for giving me a few weeks to rest and uh, just to recalibrate and recharge my batteries and get ready for our, the rest of 2020. And I cannot tell you how good that was for me. Uh, and I needed it. And thank you for, for, for giving our church the ability to do that. I also want to tell you, um, or not you, I want to with you say thank you to all the great preachers who came in here. We always try to give you the best and make sure that you get your heart built up by God's word. We do not build our city church on who it is that's preaching. We build it on who the person preaching is preaching about, which is Jesus. And so this church is built on who we believe Jesus is and who the Bible teaches us Jesus is. And we had some great preachers come in in the last many weeks. And uh, I I'm just so humbled that we got a chance to still grow as a community. Today, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look into a story in the Bible that God has just placed on my heart uh, in these last many weeks as I was praying and just walking through the last many weeks, man, this really became such a theme for me personally. And I wanted to share it with you. I've never preached this message. It's a brand new one. And so I'm really excited to share what God's laid on my heart for you today. Matthew 4, we're going to get there in just a second to kind of help set it up. I want to tell you about something that happened in my own life personally in this last week. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, I, I, I want to help you deal uh, today with, um, I want to, the title of my message today is dealing with that person. Okay. And I think some of you already know what I'm talking about, but if you've ever had someone in your life that was just like, they were that person, okay? It's, it could be the person that um, you're no longer associated, associating with. Um, it could be an ex, right? It could be the, the president of the PTA. It could be that soccer mom. You know what I'm saying? It could be the former boss or a former employee. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that it can be in our lives where you just are like, man, I cannot believe, and this is the phrase, you could be having the worst day, right? And it's just the, it's like the icing on the cake that's the, the awful cake, right? And you're just, you're, you're, you're shopping or you're just at the end of a day, the end of your rope. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, in walks that one, per that person. And you say to yourself this phrase, at least I do, and I'm sure some of you do. You say, I can't believe she just walked in. I cannot believe that he is here. I cannot believe they have the nerve to, I can't, or it's just random, right? Happenstance. You're, you're somewhere, you're like, dude, I cannot believe that is them. That's them right there. Okay. This has happened to all of us. This happened actually to me this last week, someone that uh, a decade ago, it's a decade ago relationship that, you know, it's just, I'm not involved and they're not really involved in my world. And it's like, there's no hate, but there's just like, I don't know, just like, kind of like, hey, we, um, you're not the person that I'm at the end of a tired week or a tired day or whatever. Like, I'm not really trying to deal with whatever you introduce into my 
orbit, okay? Now, I don't know how you deal with these people, <laughs> but I want to talk about how Jesus deals with those people, but I'm going to keep it real. You know me. I keep it real or I don't keep it. I'm going to be honest with you and transparent. I, I want to be like the people's pastor, okay? Like honest, transparent, real. So here you go. I'm going to show you what happened. I'm getting ready to fly out and, um, and, and, and I'm getting ready to you know, go on this plane. I look and, and one, like the person that you say, I can't believe, I cannot believe that's them. That happened to me. And I look, I'm like, oh man, I do not want to be in a conversation. I just, I just don't want to deal. But normally you can't avoid it, especially if you're like a pastor, like you just, they see you, you see them. You're just like, ah, and then you got to go be like, you know, you, you, if you're a Christian, you're like, I'm a Christian. I should probably be good. It's worse when you're a pastor. You're like, I'm not just a Christian. I'm like a pastor. I'm supposed to be like a good example of like what a Christian should be like. But I'm going to tell you guys right now, man, sometimes, man, don't let the pastor fool you. I'm still just like a normal human being. And I'm like, oh, I do not want to deal. And so I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever, when you see that person, you like duck into the next like aisle or you try to like be like out or like you try to figure out a way to just like go to the other end of the mall. And you're just like, I, I just don't want to deal. Right. Okay. I'm going to be so transparent, so funny, hopefully, and show you this is what I did. This is I, not the Lord, okay? But I want to show you, I actually took a picture of myself because I, I know many of us are not grateful for COVID and, and I, I'm not rejoicing over anyone that has had to suffer or anything like that. Like that, that's not what I'm talking about. But in all of trials and pains, there are some things that might be able to be beneficial. And the fact that I had to be walking around with a mask on my face I knew I was going to use that to my advantage, but I also knew that this person would probably be able to tell it was still me. Um, my eyes, you know, my ears or my big old nose, you know, I thought I got to get this thing wrapped up. I cannot believe that person is here. And so I'm going to just show you what I did. This is what I was wearing and this is what I did. I'm going to change camera. I'm going to come right over here. Um, this right here was what I ended up looking like so that I knew they could not see me, okay? But that wasn't good enough because I thought, man, they might be able to see my ears, they might be able to see my cheeks, my nose. So I went the next level and I said, I need a sweatshirt. I went and bought a sweatshirt in the gift shop. You know they got me for $64.99 in some crappy airport gift shop. And all of a sudden, I'm like, that might come up on your screen so you can really laugh and enjoy that. That's so you know. Look, I know what it's like where you're like, dude, I am at the end of my rope. I'm tired. I'm going through just like a long day. And I'm just like, man, I can't deal. I decided to not deal. I said, you know what? Today ain't the day. And in order for me to be a good Christian, I need to not try to talk to you. I need to try to not talk to you. You understand? Some of you don't understand because you're good people. You know, you're always sweet, amazing, kind, wonderful. You don't have any, you know, problems with this stuff. But for those of you watching from wherever you are that are a little more maybe like me, um, that's what I did probably to my ever living shame. And, and I'm going to tell you this right now. Look, this stuff happens in our lives and, and we have to sometimes deal with these people, right? We have to deal with these people. Sometimes they're in our family and they're coming over. Sometimes they're in our home and we're going home to them. There's all kinds of reasons why we have to deal with quote, that person. How do we deal with that person? And sometimes that person as fun as this could be, it's like, they're that person because they really cause some pain. They cause some trauma. They cause some difficulty. They, they left a scar. They left wounds. They, and they not really demonstrated that they're not going to do it again. And, you're, and you have all this pent up like anxiety instantly. And you start feeling your palms get sweaty and your heart rate is getting sped up and your breathing is short. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And you're replaying like how the last interaction went or how some bunch of the interactions went. And you have all this stuff happening. How do we deal with that? What I love about the Bible, what I love about Jesus is that Jesus never wanted us to deal with this stuff on our own. In fact, Jesus himself dealt with that person, okay? And he did, and he showed us what do we have to do? How can we defend against those emotions, those feelings, those experiences, taking over our lives, seizing control, and helping us through that? And, and I think that Jesus' answer is a whole lot more than the picture I showed you of my answer. So I want you to see what Jesus did so you could be more like him. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, I want to zoom in and look at, okay, how did Jesus deal when he had to come up against people when he was tired, when he was at the end of his day or end of his you know, energy level? Level and he was exhausted and then all of a sudden that person came up and um, it, it, this is this is what's crazy is uh, in Matthew chapter 4 Jesus walks through this watch what it says in, in chapter 4 verse 1 it says this um, then Jesus was led by the Spirit the, the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil which there's so much I could say about that isn't it crazy that God 
let, and not just let, led Jesus into a wilderness experience to be tempted by the devil. See, I'm going to tell you this sometimes. This is a part of following God, is that there will be times where your faith will be tested. And you won't be alone. The Spirit of God will be with you. But this is a part of following Jesus is what Jesus went through. And so Jesus is out there. And watch this, verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was, fill in the blanks, hungry, right? And some of you get hangry. You know, you know who you are. You get hangry when you get hungry, right? You just can't even manage. Jesus is there. And verse 3 says, the tempter, Satan, came to him and said, now, here you go. Here we go. Everybody say there and then. Type it in there and then real quick. There and then. Okay. So here's what's, this is early in Jesus's ministry. This is before he's done a whole bunch of stuff. He's been baptized. He's, you know, had John the Baptist, you know, say who he was, but he hasn't done a lot. He hasn't called his first disciples. He hasn't began really to preach. This is before Jesus's ministry launches. This is way before the launch of like in our, uh, our world. This is before our city church. This is stuff going on way before where that person, Satan, comes to him. And isn't it interesting that that person for you might be an ex-husband, an ex-boyfriend, an ex-wife, an ex-girlfriend. It might be dad, mom, brother, sister, former boss, former employee, old coach, you know, professor, whoever, right? All these different people in our lives that, oh my gosh, that person, some, you want to your, your kids, you know, friends, moms, and, and that's that person. Jesus is that person. Wasn't just like, I don't know, some rude mom or dad or some ex-husband or boyfriend or whatever. No, 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 no. And it wasn't even just like, like a mean person or an angry person. It was Satan. Okay. His, that person is like the actual essence of evil and pain and hurt and, and anger and everything wicked. That's the that person. And Jesus is tired. 40 days, 40 nights. You know he's exhausted. He's connecting with God, yes. But, but he's also at a place where he was fully God, yes, but he was fully human. So his human capacity still felt what you and I feel when we're tired. And so the tempter come to him, and this is important. Verse 3, if you're taking notes, check this out. Uh, verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Okay, that's the first temptation. So write down or circle in your Bible. The first temptation is stones to bread. Stones to bread. This is very practical. Okay, the first temptation for Jesus uh, that he has to deal with is the desire of all of us, which is our fleshly needs. We need to eat. We are hungry. We have basic needs, emotional and physical. And this is where Satan comes to him and he just goes right first and foremost to the needs of the flesh. Like you're hungry and you need to eat. Make these stones bread. You ain't had nothing to eat in 40 days. This is what you need and you can do it just do it right now. Jesus answers back, verse four, it is written, this is written, by the way, if you're new around here, or if you're not a Bible reader, or, or, or you're maybe not even, you wouldn't even say you're a Jesus follower or a Christian, and you are welcome here. You don't have to believe what we believe to belong around here, uh, but I do want you to understand kind of what we're studying and what we believe, because I'm a Jesus guy, I'm a Bible guy, but I didn't always used to believe that stuff, um, or this stuff as I do now, um, and so I want you to track with me. So when he says, it is written, Jesus is quoting what we would call the Bible, what he called the law and the prophets. So he's quoting the Holy Scripture of his day, um, and, and, and he's saying, it is written. He's telling Satan, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he reasserts the truth of God's word to the devil. Now, verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city, which is Jerusalem, which was the pinnacle of worship for all of the Jewish people. It's where the temple was, and the temple was where God's spirit was, is where they went to hear from God, connect with rabbis, do their sacrifices, stay in, stay in right relationship with God. Okay, which is how you used to have to do it. Back in the old days, uh, the covenant system, that's how they did it. So he takes him to the holy city, and he goes to the highest point of the temple. Okay. Everybody knew where this was. This is like the, the center of cultural everything in these people's lives. And he goes to me, he says, if you are the son of God, again, going at his identity, another message, but that's what Satan does. Satan goes at your identity of who you are in God. He wants you to question who you are to God, how valuable you are to God, how much God loves you, how much Jesus desires relationship with you, how much he wants to forgive you, how much he wants to invite you into a grand mission and purpose in your life to connect the gifts he's given you to his grand kingdom work to go rescue and save people from the bottomless pit of sin. And 
and Jesus is, is, is at the pinnacle of this place, and this is where Satan does what he does. If you are the Son of God, he goes right at the root of who Jesus' real identity is and questions it. Remember this, when you begin to question how much God loves you, when anything tries to make you question, even if it's a Christian pastor, even if it's somebody who says they're a believer in Jesus, if they start trying to make you question and say and, 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 and contort scripture and use scripture to make you think God don't love you, God doesn't desire a relationship with you, that he's not a father that desires close relationship with his children, I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't listening to the voice of Jesus talk about scripture, you're listening to the voice of Satan talk about scripture, and he's just using Christian voices to do it. Do trust. He says this, if you are the son of God, if that's your identity and who you are in God and who you are as God, throw yourself down. Now watch this. For it is written. So now Satan again is quoting scripture like Jesus scripture. Not again, but he does that. He says, for it is written. Now, now Satan's going to quote scripture. Whoa. If you grew up Christian or you grew up around, you know, Catholicism or believing in the scripture is holy, this is going to be a trip for you. Watch, watch, watch this. For it's written, Jesus, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Whoa. So wait a minute. Here we have Satan opposing Jesus. He's the enemy, the spiritual enemy of Jesus, and he's opposing a spiritual force in Jesus. And what is he doing to do it? He's using holy scripture to fight his enemy. What a trip. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Jesus answered him and said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus recounters with more truth in scripture. Okay. Now this is, this, that was the second one. So the first one is become bread. That's the desires of the flesh. I'm hungry now. Now it's the high point of the temple. Now what's that temptation really? Well, here's what it was. Everybody's looking for the Messiah. The Messiah was promised in the Old Testament, okay? All the prophets prophesied this Messiah is going to come. He's going to set things right. He's going to change the world. He's going to redeem all of, all of the world, all of the people of Israel. He's going to redeem them. And, and so everyone's looking for this, like, guy. Well, Jesus is the Messiah, but they're not, they don't know that. And what Satan knows is that Jesus is God's son. So he's throwing out doubts of something he already knows, number one. Number two, then he goes like this. He says, hey, uh, throw yourself off the highest point of the temple. And then he twists and manipulates scripture to try to talk Jesus into doing it. Why would that be even tempting? Well, the reason it would be tempting, okay, is because Jesus knows what's ahead of him. He knows in order for him to get people to know he is really God's son, what he's going to have to do is go to the cross and die and then rise from the dead so people who believed in him see him alive and go uh you could kill me if you want to but i saw the man die then i saw him alive then i hung out with him for 40 days and then he ascended in front of my eyes so we're gonna tell everybody that he loves everyone and he wants to forgive everyone and you can have right relationship with the god who made you through his son named jesus that's how the thing got started now watch this in this place is where all of a sudden he's saying the devil's saying to him like hey you don't have to go through all that you don't have to, what you got to go suffer for? You don't need Judas to betray you. You don't need your mama to watch you get whipped. You don't have to go through all that suffering, put all that on your family. You don't have to be betrayed. You don't have to have all your best friends act like they don't even know you. You don't have to get beat up. They don't have to rip out your beard. You don't have to get the 39 lashes on your back. You certainly don't need to carry this cross. And then you don't need to have your shoulders dislocated and nails put inside of you. And then on your, you know, into your feet. And then you're up there for hours and hours and hours until all of a sudden, like, you know, you collapse into the liquid in your, in, in, in your chest and you asphyxiate and, and drown in, in, in your own lungs and you, and you die, okay? You don't have to go through all that. What you got to do all that for, Jesus? Look, look, look. Just jump off the temple, which is the pinnacle of worship for all the people you're here to show that you're their Messiah. And if you don't hit the ground and some angels catch you and then just lightly drop you right down, guess what everyone's going to know? You're the son of God. You could have your identity, you could have your calling, you could have your purpose, you could have the kingdom power that you came to get, and you don't need to go through any suffering to have it. That's what Satan always offers you. He offers you a shortcut to a manufactured purpose. He offers you a shortcut to a manufactured plan that is his manufactured plan, but not the real one, because the real one always involves some suffering, some difficulty, some pain, some trust, some faith, some hardship. Why? Because there's resistance from the kingdom of darkness, and so you're going to have to go through it. And so he says, hey, you can avoid all that. You don't need to do any hard work, and you can have all of the, all 
all of the, the, the pretentious ideas people would have about the Messiah. You can have all of the respect, all the love, all the adoration you're looking for. You'll be highly respected, highly loved, highly adored. All you got to do is jump off the temple. And see, this was the second temptation. The, the, the desire of the flesh was the bread. Now it's the desire uh, inside of himself to be respected, to be loved, the pretension of life, the, the high love, the high adoration. Okay, now we come to verse 8, which is the third temptation. Watch this. We're going somewhere. Um, look at your neighbor right now and say, we're going somewhere. Type that in. We're going somewhere. We are going somewhere. Here we go. It says, verse 8, uh, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him, watch this, all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Wow. And this, he says to Jesus, I will give you, because uh, Satan is the kingdom of the world. That's his domain. The, this world, this place, this is his world. It's his domain. He says, I will give you all of this if you will bow down and worship me. Wow. Wow. So what's this temptation? This temptation is the temptation of the eyes, okay? This is, look at what you see, Jesus. Take a look around. You see all this success. You see all this money. You see all the beauty. You see all the status. You see all the fame. You see all the fortune. You see all the riches. You see all the health. You see everything that you would ever want. Health, riches, fame, fortune, success, businesses that launch, new businesses that launch, bigger house, better car, like beauty, untold beauty. You have it all, all the splendor that you could ever have that you chase on this planet, that this world says, if you just had all this, then you'd be satisfied in your soul. I'll give it all to you. You just, you just need to bow down and worship me. So that's the third temptation. Of course, we know that what Jesus says, if we've read this before, if you've never read it before, here's how Jesus responds. He says to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only, solamente, only, we only do that. Verse 11 says, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now, I want to help you understand a little bit about what happened here. Because if you're a theologian, you might have heard this. If you've never heard this, you need to know. Jesus in theology is called the second Adam, okay? The second Adam, not like Adam, like, um, like molecular structure, but Adam, A-D-A-M, the second Adam. That he was, the first Adam was God's created Adam, and Jesus comes and he's the other Adam. Adam got it wrong, Jesus gets it right. Where Adam fails, Jesus sets it correct. Where Adam was supposed to be able to be the one that, that, that showed us the perfection of relationship with God in the Garden of Eden, but he, he failed, he sinned, him and his wife Eve sinned, and broke right relationship with God, and sin entered the world, and began to decay things, both the earthly planet and the things in our own soul, so that sin became a common part of our DNA and our wiring. No, that's the first Adam. And then the second Adam comes, but he doesn't violate what God calls him to do. Jesus doesn't violate who God is and what God is supposed to be. He is perfect, sinless, awesome, amazing, truthful constantly. And then right here, we see that he actually stands in temptation. But I want you to see something amazing about what he stands in. Because I want to now take you all the way back to the first Adam and Eve. And I want to read to you out of Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. This is a trip. Watch this. This is, this is the account of the fall of mankind. Satan had come and he tempted Eve. He talks to Eve and Adam's standing there with her. And he says, you're not going to die. You don't have, you can touch this tree. Don't worry about it. But he gets her to, to trust him, to doubt God's goodness, that God is holding out on them. And so they need to take advantage and do their own thing, find their own way because God's not going to be good. God can't be trusted. Now watch this. Verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was ready, good for food. That's number one. What is that? Well, the first temptation was the desire of the flesh. Make these stones bread. Number one, good for food. That's the desire of the flesh. Get some food, stones to bread. Eat this tree's fruit. Why? You need food. You need something practical. It's okay. It's fine. It's practical. Just do it. Doesn't matter what God said. Just do it. You need to do, have this. And number two, pleasing to the eye. 
That means that what? That's the desire of the eyes. That was the splendor, the riches, the fame, the fortune. You, you, you have all the success and status. It's not just the flesh good for food. It's pleasing to the eye. That's the temptation of the desire of what your eyes see and your eyes want and what you want to be able to attain. And, ready? And also desirable for gaining wisdom, which would be the high point of the temple. Why? When you got wisdom, everyone thinks you're it. You're it. Everyone thinks you're amazing. Everyone looks to you. You have the full pretension of life. You're highly respected. You're highly loved. You're highly adored. I hope you are tracking with me because Satan came, lied to Eve, lied to Adam, and got them to take the same exact out, the shortcut to those things. And Jesus comes and where every bit of place that they were offered as humanity to break the connection with God, Jesus comes and perfects perfectly realigns, reestablishes, reconnects, reinvites and says, I'll be perfect and I'll pass this test. I will pass this temptation. I will be one who you can't do this because you are Adam and Eve's son or daughter, but I am God's son and I will do this. I will stand strong. I will be perfect and I will resist the temptation so that in me, you can resist the temptations of the pleasing to the eye, of the fleshly needs that you need, or of the pretensions of success and the fame and the fortune and more money. And if I had more, then I'd be okay. Jesus says, those are lies. And in me, you can have truth. You can get the things you really need, you really want. Those three aren't it. And we've spent the last many years figuring that out. And Jesus says, I'm the answer to how sin broke relationship inside of you with you, you and Eve, Eve and Adam, and all the family, and you and God. I am the answer. See, what Jesus shows us is that he is who we should look to to deal with the temptations of our own life. But how does Jesus deal with it? This is where I want to teach you a little bit, and then I want to help you put this to practice in your life. How does Jesus do this? Now, I grew up uh, in and out of church, but what I was always taught was that God's word is the spirit, the sword of the spirit, and it's, and, and it's to be quoted, and you use the scripture. Why? Well, because it's sharper than a double-edged sword. True. And it's able to pierce into dividing marrow into the heart and the soul. True. But a lot of what we end up thinking in Christianity is that the Bible is to be weaponized to fight Satan and his lies, right? To fight other people in their lies that they're saying and spewing on behalf of Satan. So we weaponize the Bible and use it as a sword to combat and offensively attack and make sure, make sure people know where they are wrong. But that's actually not what we see in the story of Jesus and his temptation. See. That's not what the Bible is actually supposed to be for. See, the problem is, is that when it comes to dealing with that person, Satan, Jesus is dealing with that person only because Jesus has already been perfectly aligned with Scripture's truth. What do I mean by that? Well, this is what I mean by that. We try to use the scripture to make sure that we go out and we get it to work on everyone else who are you being used by Satan to spew lies and, and untruth. And this is what the Bible and this verse and that. And th we think we're supposed to use it as a weaponed attack. But actually, if it was true that the Bible is supposed to be just some attacking weapon to oppose the spiritual forces against you, that would be extremely problematic because that's exactly how Satan used it. So if that's what the purpose of it was, then how come it didn't work when he used it to attack his, his enemy, his adversary, which was Jesus? He uses scripture. How come it didn't defeat Jesus? How come it didn't whip up on Jesus if that's what it's for? I'll tell you why, because that's not what it's for. No, what we're supposed to do isn't use scripture, isn't use the truth of scripture to go out and see how could I get it to work on everyone else. We're actually supposed to use scripture, not offensively, but defensively to Actually, not go outside to everyone else, but to let the truth of Scripture come inside and cut away the sin and the brokenness of my own heart. See, if we would begin to actually do what Scripture is supposed to do, which is not to go out and make sure everybody knows how they're missing it and how they're wrong and off. But we said, that's not what Jesus modeled. What Jesus modeled was, I am already aligned with Scripture. So when you tell me things, Satan, that are not true, I don't even really, I just tell you what I'm already standing in. Why? Because I've let it be in me and I am in it. See, but I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. So what does that mean for us? Well, when we start to feel the pressures of the things that are wrong or false in our lives, what we have to do is be able to come to a place where we say, God, I don't want to use scripture or my truth or my wisdom to start making sure everyone knows how wrong they are. God, I need to let scripture come into me and do a work in me. Ready? I've got to let God's word do a work in me. 
not use it to see how I could get it to do a work in you. I have no power to help it change you. I only have the power to allow it to change me. See, I can fight the temptations of Satan, not with a scripture verse. Oh, I'm going to say the scripture verse and then you'll go away. Yeah, you resist the day of the devil. He will flee, James, Jesus' brother says. And it's true, but resisting the devil isn't you just grabbing some scripture and being like, here, I'm going to say a scripture and hocus pocus, you go away. No, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Here's what you're supposed to do. Let scripture cut away the sin in your heart. And then sin gets out of your heart. Not because you quote some scripture and stay the way you are. Keep acting the way you are. Keep being the way you are. Keep living the way you do. Keep thinking the same thoughts and never letting God's word come in and say, those aren't my words. Those aren't my thoughts. Those aren't my ways. I want to cut. Hey, I love you. Can I, let me, can I clear out some of that debris in your heart? Can I clear out the cloudiness? Can I get rid of some of those lies? You've got so many lies, desires of the flesh, desires of, of pretension and of success and of, of, of all the world offers you, the splendor of the world and the desires of the eyes, things that you'll see that you just want more of. I got to tell you, can you let me, let my word come in and help cut away those lies from being something that you think that that's what it's going to do? Because when you do that, that's when Satan flees from you. That's when he leaves you because he realizes no matter how much I twist scripture, no matter how much I offer him these desires, he already knows who he is in God. He, she knows who she is in God. She stands resolute. Why? Because she has let God's word come in and cut away the false lies the world has told her, the enemy has told her about who she is to Jesus, who she is in God, and what the world can do to satisfy her soul. My friend, this is what the Bible is for. It is not a weapon for the outside, so we won't fail when we're tempted. No, it is a carving knife for the inside of us, so we will be like Jesus is. And we let scripture carve away the ugly parts of me, not grab it and go, that's why you are all so wrong. And this is why these temptations need to flee from me. No, these temptations will flee from me when I begin to let God's truth and word go and sting the wounded, infected areas of my heart and cleanse them. It will let me be able to deal with the right that person because here's the thing that we've been doing wrong. You want to know how to deal with that person? Start dealing with the right that person because you've been dealing with that person that's on the outside and Jesus brought me here into your life right now, wherever you're watching is to tell you this, the person he wants you to deal with isn't the one on the outside, it's that person on the inside. He wants to deal with that person, not her, not him, not them, not who didn't, who wasn't, who hadn't, no, you. He loves you so much. He wants to get his word to carve away the broken lies, to pull out the weeds, to get in there and go, no, 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 you're not aligning with my truth. And that's why you keep feeling these things, repeating these stories, having these arguments, getting wound up. What? Shh. You're using the scripture just to attack the outside. And I need you to turn it on the inside and let me go to work because then you'll align with me. And then the temptations don't have the power to own you that they have. The Bible isn't to be used, again, for a weapon of truth on others. It is for me so that all those things in me get cut away. Then and only then, Satan begins to lose the power he has over you because you're standing not in the power of what you tell everyone the Bible says. Who cares if the Bible says it if you don't let it actually say it to you and cut away the things in you? It won't have any power just because you know the verse. Why do we know that? Because Satan knew the verse. And Satan is evil and broken and wrong. So it doesn't matter if you know the scripture and you can say it. Satan knew it and he said it. That didn't mean he was living it. It didn't mean he was following Jesus. It didn't mean he was letting Jesus' truth change him. He still stood in lies, though he knew the scripture. My friend, don't stand in the lies that the enemy is feeding you telling yourself that you're good because you believe in Jesus, do you have scripture? Can I tell you that you may think that that is good and you're great and you and Jesus are good, but you don't have the voice and the sound of Jesus and the way he uses scripture. You're using scripture like Satan was using scripture. Why? Because Jesus knew that, Je I'm sorry, Satan knew who Jesus was. He knew Jesus had, he believed in Jesus and he knew scripture. Just because you know scripture, just because you believe in Jesus, don't make you actually letting God's truth, God's word change you. It changes you when you turn it on the inside of you and stop using it to change and affect and point out everyone on the outside. That's what Satan wouldn't do. He wouldn't let what Jesus said change him. He was using it to try to change Jesus and make Jesus line up with him. 
how often do we try to make Jesus line up with me instead of saying, I got to let you change me and I need to line up with you and turn that thing on getting rid of this. How do we take this home? How do we make this a part of our life? Well, I would say, I think in the here and now, there's two things. Um, number one, we got to start looking inward, honestly. Looking inward, honestly. What does that mean? You got to grab your closest friends. You got to talk to Jesus and you got to invite them to give some introspection to, hey, what is off in me? Where is there something out of alignment with what you and I both say we want to be as Jesus followers? Number one. Number two, you got to let God change you and, and, and we got to stop looking to be right about them. This is, this is such a challenge for me. I, I don't, maybe not you, but for me, it's so easy for me to want to be right about them and use what I know about scripture to be like, this is why they're all wrong. Instead of saying, that's for you and you and them. But for me and you, this is what scripture's for. It ain't to make sure everyone knows when they're wrong. It's to help me understand how I could become more like you. Would you cut that ugliness out? Would you get that out of my life? And I got to be a, a kind of man that says, God, I want you to change me. So it's not me trying to, you know, avoid bumping into them in a Marshalls or some aisle at the grocery store. It's no longer me. Well, I don't want to bump into that person. Now it's actually learning to deal with that person. And that person isn't them. That person is me. That person is you. How do I start dealing with the right person? And I think that's the things that God has for us to do. And so I want to challenge you this week to change your perspective. Pay attention to the words that come out of your mouth. Listen to how you come across when you have, some of you, it is ingrained in your family systems to constantly want to critique and talk about what everyone else is doing wrong. And all that is is a smoke screen to avoid you having honest discussions with Jesus about what God wants to do right in you. Why? Because that's what Satan does. And he has tricked some of us, me, you, all of us at times. We get tricked into using scripture and our belief in Jesus the way Satan used his belief in Jesus and his knowledge of scripture, which is how do I get Jesus to try to line up with what I think about everybody? And that's using scripture and belief in Jesus like Satan, not like Jesus. In our city, Friends, family all around the world, there's no power in that to overcome. There's only power to be bound, to be trapped, to be lied to, to be discouraged and disappointed and beat up by the power of darkness. You could be set free of that right now, but you have to bow your knee to the truth of who Jesus says and align with him and let his scripture come in and start doing the, 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 the selective work of carving out the ugly, broken, lies and, and heartbreak that becomes our mandate of how we live and look at how we change in the outside of others and say, Jesus, I invite you to change the inside of me. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for your word and thank you for standing. You were the second Adam. And as the second Adam who fixed what the first Adam did and what all of, our, all of us have done since, God, we, we look to you, Jesus. We look to you because you stood against the desires of the flesh. You stood against the desires of pretension and, and success and, and, and splendor. And you stood, God, against the desires of the eyes and, and, and what would look good and be good. And, and so we could trust you to stand against those things. But we also saw the way you stood against them, the way you stood against temptation and evil and Satan himself, that person that you stood against, it's because you were that person. You were perfectly aligned with truth because you are truth. But we're not, and so we need you. Would you let scripture this week carve away the parts of our pride, our arrogance, um, our anger, our fears, God? I just come against fear in Jesus' name and ask God that you would remove fear and anger from operating and controlling our lives. I ask for everyone right now who needs this prayer to count for more than just the end of a service prayer. God, I ask that you would go through their TV screen, their tablets, their phones, their, 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 their earphones, God, and get into their soul and their heart and break the power of fear and anger, God, over their lives, God. I ask that you would remove the lies, God, of the enemy, of who they are to you, Jesus, that if they've been lied to and told that they're, they're nothing to you, that you don't care about them, that you don't love them, God, I come against those lies in Jesus' name, and I ask you to speak truth 
of your love, your redemption, your power, and that you redeem the broken things of this world. And if we step into you and let your word cleanse us, change us, fix us, rearrange us, we'll be more like you. And then we'll have the real fulfillment we're looking for that the splendor of this world has not answered and will never answer. Jesus, I pray that over every friend of mine, every one of the members of our city church, God, everyone watching around the world, would we see it, put to work this week. May we turn the scriptures powerful, sharp truth and turn it away from the outside of those and go to work on the inside of us by the power of your spirit. I ask you to do this in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. Hey, uh, important. This is for the church. If you're if our city church, you just checked in here. Thanks for being here. But if you're part of our church, this is very important to me. Uh, next week, if you want extra credit or if you're just watching, I don't care. I'm going to preach on John 9. I would love you to go read John 9. Read all you can about John 9. Read John 8. Read John 10. Spend some time in that if you want to do extra credit this week because I'm preaching on that next week to prepare us as a church for our series, our home series, because I know, I know God needs to help us with our homes right now because we are just all in them. They've been carrying more weight than normal and we want to help your home uh, and, and be able to let God's truth help your home. So please, uh, be prepared next week. And if you've got friends that they don't do church, they ain't been to church or they've been disconnected for a while, please invite them next week. Uh, share this link, share that with them and invite them to our home series because I really believe throughout the month of August, God is going to do great works in our city church and through our city church. All right. See y'all next Sunday. Can't wait to preach. Love you guys. Have a great week. Bye.